everyone, and welcome to the 2021 Virtual Gaithersburg Book Festival. I'm Gaithersburg City Council Member Lori Ann Sales, your host for this presentation. Before we get started, I'd like to ask you to please support today's authors by purchasing their books from our wonderful bookseller partner, Politics and Prose, one of America's premier independent bookstores. You'll find purchases to links in the presentation description. Given all we've been through over the past year, it's so important to support local jobs and the local economy. I also wanna extend a big thank you to our 2021 featured sponsor, the David and Michael Blair Family Foundation for their generous support. Okay, let's get started. So we have with us today, Sandra Beasley, Kim Adonisio, and Catherine E. Young. Three explosive voices tackling not only privilege and love, but also the poetic form. Today, they will explore their singular approach to lyricism and poetry and the joys and challenges of tackling themes like race and sexuality in poetry. In Made to Explode, Sandra Bleet Beasley interrogates the landscapes of her life in decisive, fearless, and precise poems that fuse intimacy and intensity. Sandra is the author of four poetry collections. Honors for her work include the 2019 Munster Literature Center's Jean Montague International Poetry Fellowship, a 2015 NEA Fellowship, and four DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities Fellowships. Now We're Getting Somewhere by Kim Adonizio is a dark, no holds barred and often hilarious collection that veers between the poles of self and world. Kim is the author of eight poetry collections, two novels, two story collections and two books on writing poetry. She has received fellowships from the NEA and Guggenheim Foundation pushcart prizes in both poetry and the essay, and her collection, Tell Me, was a National Book Award finalist in poetry. Woman Drinking Absinthe by Catherine E. Young is a collection of poems that feature women who chose to abandon convention at their own peril. Catherine finds literary touchstones among sources as varied as German folk tales, Greek drama, and the Old Testament. Catherine E. Young is the author of the 2014 Miller Williams Arkansas Poetry Prize finalists, State of the Border Guards, two chapter books, and is the editor of Written in Arlington. She was named the inaugural Poet Laureate for Arlington, Virginia in 2016 to 2018. Moderating today's impressive panel of poets is Reuben Jackson, author of the book Scattered Clouds, New and Selected Poems. Ruben is the archivist with the University of the District of Columbia's Felix E. Grant Jazz Archives. He is the author of two volumes of poetry and his poems have, included, have been included in over 40 anthologies. Welcome to all of you. For what I'm sure will be a scintillating conversation. You know, I was thinking about the fact that April is both National Poetry Month and Jazz Appreciation Month. Now, needless to say, there are a lot of carryovers of both genres. But I, I started uh, this morning thinking about two quotes, one from a poet, Ezra Pound, and another from someone I would consider an oral poet, the saxophonist, yet Lester Young, and they read as follows. So um, Ezra Pound said, make it new. And then in 1959, Lester Young, one of the last interviews, he, he told a reporter, well, his ethos was simple. He said, you've got to be original, man. And what we have today are three poets who, whose work personifies this, you know, the originality, making it new. And the other thing I'll, I'll add before asking each of you to, to read a poem is this, uh, and, and forgive me, folks, you know, I'm the English major with um, a chronic uh, metaphoritis. So I'm always thinking metaphorically, much to some of my friends' chagrin. But anyway, thinking of two of the titles, 
two of the three titles we'll be hearing uh, work from today. Made to Explode and Getting Somewhere. Now, you know, thinking about the possibility within language and what we as writers, uh, saxophonists, try to do is to get somewhere. So what I'd like to do to get things started here is ask each of you to read one poem uh, from your newest works and, and congratulations on those. They're, they're, uh, they're wonderful. I'd say more, but that'd be profane and that would not be great. But uh, and anyone want to jump in first and, and, and just get us rolling here? It'd be great. Um, okay, well, it, I'm gonna, I picked this one, um, speaking of metaphor, it's got some metaphors in it, but maybe it's a little bit representative of those poles of self and world that were mentioned earlier. So this is, The Earth is About Used Up, and it actually takes its title from a line by the poet Paul Guest. The Earth is About Used Up, like a sodden tampon and no place to throw it away like an armpit yellow vintage blouse with see-through pearl bubble sleeves, like a tissue travel pack in a foreign bathroom and you have to squat over a hole in the floor. The earth is about used up is the point I'm trying to drunkenly steer through the potholed streets into the suburban garage of your ears. Though you probably already know what's up with the earth, but I'm telling you because because, 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 because the earth is about used up. Like the preserved atrophied brain of a retired NFL defensive lineman leaking cryoprotectant. Like the tender ass of the cow and the large heart of the racehorse. Like a wind up ladybug, ladybug crawling in decelerating circles on lux touch marble tiles inlaid with precious stones. Even the ocean is gasping for air while someone smokes a cigarette through their throat hole and sodas go flat in the heat. And a stack of National Geographics bloats in a rained on cardboard box in a fallen shed some animal dragged itself into to shit away its life. I'm standing on that box with my teeny megaphone bringing you the news you know wildly virtue signaling, waving my mortal handkerchief, dropping it at your feet, where it burns, it burns here. I don't want it. You take it, please, you take it. Thank you, thank you. Oof, all right. <laughs> wow. Next. <laughs> yes, the alphabet has done me no favors. I have to follow Kim. <laughs> um, so I chose a poem, uh, I chose a poem that is part of a suite of poems that deal with disability in Made to Explode, which I had written about my food allergies in my first collection, very much, uh, the sequence was called Allergy Girl, and it was very much in this space of not victimhood, but very, very intensely personally oriented around all these food allergies. And then I wrote a, a memoir, Don't Kill the Birthday Girl, on a similar theme. All of which I, I, my point is, is that the, in this book, the way allergies are handled is more political and it's in more in consideration of the ways that the society around us actually creates the friction that makes disability hard, not the disability itself. So this is a, a poem, you'll hear it use a template of a series of kind of incompleted uh, dictates. Customer service is we take pride in serving the, we're accustomed to servicing the, please take the attached, please answer these six, please answer these eight. This will only be a quick, if microphones don't reach, then if ramps are required, then if you need audio, then if you need visual, then we request one week's, we request one month's. All reasonable requests will, a flock of surveys is a surveillance. A stampede of stairs is an architecture. An expectation of elevators is a favor. An oh crap of crips is a caucus. But I have a aunt who is, 
I had a friend who was, we practice best. We follow the, you have to see our, you have to stand up for your help is so your answers will be. Mm, mm, mm. Thank you, Sam. Catherine Young. Yes. So uh, I'm going to read yeah. a poem that comes early in the book. It's in six little short parts and it's called the bear. The bear marauds inside my garden, plants his tracks among the roses. His scent lingers in the hollies, the yews. I gather broken branches in my arms, pocking hands and face with prickling leaves. Inside the house, my cats sniff anxiously, note the bitter tang of bear on my skin. Mm. They press their noses to the window, seeking solace in the glass. Clear-eyed frame that holds us back, bladed pain that keeps us safe. Two, the bear says, I'm not dangerous. Let me make a den for you. I'll decorate the walls with shells, spread soft moss across your bed. Songs of falling water will soothe the air. Sometimes, perhaps, I'll kiss your full pleading lips, though they're not the type to which I'm accustomed. Three, I tell the bear, my prince will come claim me, clear, uninflected. The bear just laughs. Does his skin smell of musk? His flesh taste of honey? Does his fur warm you in winter? Does he know to smooth your cheek with all his claws drawn in? Four, when he holds me in his arms, I hear roaring in my ear. Five, the bear says, look closely. There's a ring set in my nose. And though I've stroked his snout a thousand times, I've never before now felt iron beneath my fingers, says the bear. Once I begged for my living, recited rhymes, my paw outstretched. I screwed the ring in myself, thought I'd live better with a chain, with four walls to steady me. Six, the bear shambles through crowds, snout turning side to side, his eyes always seeking. I don't know what he's seeking. He prefers I fall two steps back. That way, no one shouts. Look, a woman's chained to that bear. Although the chain's invisible. Although at night, when he leads me out, no one sees he's a bear. Thank you, Catherine. Well, as you hear, we have very three very distinctive, very arresting voices. And again, I'm, I'm playing with the music, you know, jazz appreciation of poetry, the, what, uh, as Amir Baraka said, poetry is speech, music, and thinking about themes. Um, I sent each of you a question which in part takes a quote from uh, a poem by Amiri Baraka or Leroy Jones, as he was known at that time. The quote is, let my poems be a graph of me, G-R-A-P-H. And I'm wondering, thinking about your body of work, uh, themes, and I know, Sandra, you touched upon this to some degree a couple of minutes ago, but uh, where do the, the questions and the works in your most recent book stand in terms of your, uh, well, thematic progression as a writer? Are you, did you each distinctively decide to make a concerted effort to address one thing or another? Do, they, do these things pop up organically and when you're sifting through the manuscript, do you look up and go, oh, this is what's going on? And I'm sure the answers are as different as, as your work is, but uh, we'll just we'll go in reverse order here to try to keep things moving. So Catherine, if you don't mind starting us off, that'd be wonderful. 
So this book is a completely different book from the last book. The last book was essentially a love letter to Russia. All the poems were set in Russia or the former Soviet Union. Um, and they were, um, I, I don't want to say outsider poems because I had lived there a lot, but it, in many ways they were observing poems. They were from somebody who wasn't from there sort of sinking into as much as possible a different culture and, and a different way of being in the world really, both the Soviet period and then the Russian um, um, uh, government after that, the Russian state after that. So this book is uh, not set in Russia at all. That's a big thematic change. Um, and I would say that this book is more, um, it, it's more interested in, in some of the interests that started in that book, but it's, it's, it's uh, working with folklore, it's working with um, sort of conscious dramatic tropes. Uh, I'm more interested in um, sort of uh, very theatrical um, poems this time. And there's a lot of, there are some persona poems and just generally trying to try on different costumes, different settings. Um, the themes of both books, but this book also are is sort of, they're sort of timeless. I mean, they're, they deal with, um, the bad things maybe that people do to one another. Um, and they've been doing those bad things to one another since the Greeks and since before the Greeks. And, um, and they're also doing them on real housewives. And I mean, so the Kardashians, whatever. So um, there's, there's really, you know, no, nothing new under the sun, but this book is trying to look at those same old things, the, the ways that human beings maybe disappoint one another and trying on costumes and, and trying to set up uh, tableaus um, just, just to kind of play with with ways of looking at human nature. Mm, mm, great, thank you, thank you. Sandra. Yeah, I had worked on an anthology of food poems just a couple of years prior, a book called Vinegar and Char. And mm. uh, when you're you know processing everyone else's food poems, you invariably get to write some of your own or you see things that you, you wish were written. So I started with uh, I started towards the critical mass of the next collection by writing about food and then realized I couldn't write about food without writing about history and my grandparents' generation. And also, frankly, like having lived at this point 20 years uh, to start in Virginia, now 20 years in DC, really interrogating this question of are, do I live in a northern or a southern place? Mm -hmm. What that mix of influences? What 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 was my place even in editing an anthology of southern food poems? Right. So I just had to think through these things, and and so that led very naturally into the at, at times difficult topics that that I address in in Made to Explode. And the only other thing I'll mention is I had spent a brief period of time in Ireland, uh, as was mentioned in my bio, about three months, and I I loved it there. And they place such value on poetry and they place such responsibility on poets to be the statesmen of the country. And I think that actually gave me a kind of charge, a kind of dictate that when I came back, I wanted to write almost ambitiously political poems in a way that I had backed away from uh, in some previous work. So yeah, so I just decided to let it all hang out basically. <laughs> I, I will say as a Southerner, I was born in Augusta, Georgia. And and uh, when I lived in Vermont, I told people, well, and this is not grammatically correct, but I'd say the Northerner I go, the Southerner I became. And and I think your work, and we'll talk a bit about this a little bit later, but um, as you know, being Southern is not just geographical. It's, a, you know, it's not just a metaphor, it's a life. And I think your work does a lot in capturing like the nuance and particularly with race, the way a difference between Yankees, as my Aunt Bertha would say, deal with race as opposed to, uh, you know, the more, let's say, deep fried way of things. But but uh, mm -hmm. so I I applaud your courage in doing it. And and uh, and to go back to Lester Young, the original approach to it and putting your your, um, you know, your mark on the changing scene, let's put it that way. Thank you. Kim, how yeah. about you? Uh, I, I love that comment about the graph, the the graph mm -hmm. of the self, because I've often thought of that, you know, that every writer, every writer's work is like a map of their psyche. 
Perfect. And, you know, I mean, and thinking about themes, you know, like the, you know, the Greeks were obsessed, some of the Greek poets were obsessed with honor and war, and then the metaphysicals were obsessed with their relationship to God and their faith and, and the romantics with imagination, you know, and so, so then maybe that's partly the ethos of a time and a cultural, you know, milieu, milieu. <laughs> sounds so formal to say a cultural anyway the zeitgeist whatever you want to call it um you know so i think that um that any any writer i mean yeah as catherine says there's nothing new under the sun i mean and almost all poets are obsessed with mortality and death because why not death is interested in us so oh <laughs> yeah it's very interesting <laughs> So um, obsessively so. So, so I think that um, that my themes have been pretty much the same from book to book. I mean, they've all been really about the self and the world, and what's my relationship to the suffering of other people, and 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 um, probably self destructing self destructive behavior in there as well. And so um, I think this book just sort of is looking for new ways to talk about those things, because mm. it's always that, you know, you don't want to just repeat and repeat the things you've before, you want to try to find a new way. Right. Um, and so, so that's, you know, just trying to find new ways of, of voicing that and experimenting yeah. with that. So a lot of different sort of poems, but the themes are absolutely the same, pretty mm -hmm. much. There, um, the the two uh, epigraphs that begin the book, I think, cover it pretty well. Leonard Cohen's "Everybody Knows the Captain Lied," and we know which asshole he means, or we mean now because it it always is true somewhere. And yeah. then the other one, is Elizabeth Taylor, with something like, um, you know, put on put on some lipstick, pour a drink, and pull yourself together. And mm. those two. Things are, I think, the the twin things informing the book. Yes. Thank you. You know, I think for each of you, uh, and because I work at a university and when things are, you know, pre-pandemic, I was around young people, you hear parlance that someone who's 64 wouldn't have used. But the what I want to say is that the flow of your respective works is just wonderful. And, and um it's thinking about what Catherine said, the fact that we are extensions of themes and, and conflicts with in humanity, which have been around for a minute, as kids say. Uh, but I really, again, respect the way in which I think your works are both um, accessible, but um, intriguing in the best way. Like you hear a great pianist in a club when you could, and you'd hear they're playing the blues, but you hear like three or four bars and you go, yeah, that's a variation on a theme to kind of touch upon what, what you just said, Kim. And uh, I'm wondering, though, with, you know, this reality that we really are, to use this phrase again, variations, is it daunting? Was it daunting with these particular books to, to think, well, maybe, A, I've touched upon this before or, oh, boy, I mean, is it scary to 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 jump into that water knowing that, uh, you know, we are part of this long tradition as writers and, you know, anyone can can jump in on this. Oh, and to bring Lester Young, who seems to be hovering over me, you know, he told this same interviewer, he said, I try not to be a repeater pencil. So I guess I'm also thinking about, you know, like methodology. What do you do if you bump up against something or you're imitating yourself if, if that's an issue. So I know that's kind of multi-tiered and a little like multi-highway there, but anybody who wants to would like to jump in with that. Well, I um, I mean, I, I worked with the prose poem for a fairly extended set of, you know, almost all of a second section, it, which mm -hmm. is monuments and memorials. The title convention puts right. a shorthand for the name of the memorial and then midnight. So there is this kind of implicit speaker standing in front of the Lincoln, the Jefferson, the Titanic Memorial, I mean, some of the, some of the more obscure ones, uh, right. you know, in turn thinking about these spaces and thinking about what history edits out and route to making the official story. Uh, and I, I've written prose poems here and there, but, but I was really engaged with thinking about resisting the decorative, right? And, and kind of 
also finding a way to incorporate all of the trivia and research, but not wanting to let it choke off the musicality. Mm -hmm. Somehow mm -hmm. just working in the prose poem shape to help me. So, so I've always, my work is always immersed in research. I'm always kind of curious about the world around me, but that was a slightly different subject and then a slightly different formal mode. I don't know if anybody else in this conversation maybe has something like that, where just sometimes it's as simple as adopting a different shape stanza or like a different <laughs> length of line from what you've been doing recently. It's just enough to freshen up your, your investment and your sense of doing something new, even if the yes. theme is, is familiar. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes, nice. Catherine. One of the things that I did differently this book, and it's it just the book allowed me to do it, was I wrote a number of poems that have to do with sort of science and math which are interests of mine, um, but nothing I've ever pursued uh, professionally. And there's even a little love poem in there to a, a piece of an achondrite, which is a part of, which is a kind of meteorite, uh, which fell, which was blasted off Mars millions of years ago and made its way slowly, slowly, slowly across 10 million years and exploded in Egypt in uh, the early part of the 20th century. It was a 22 pound meteorite, achondrite, and there's a piece of it in the Air and Space Museum. And you can go in and touch this rock that started on Mars, you know, billions and billions of years ago. Um, and I, like Sandra, I, I, there's a lot of research in, in my writing as well. But this one in particular was just, you know, just so marvelous, you know, to contemplate. And then I sort of made up the history of the rock and what was going on Earth, on Earth at the same time. And I had a lot of fun. Um, there's, there's one found poem in the book, which is... Um, from the philosophical trans transactions of um, the Royal Society uh, from mm. the 1600s, um, which was, you know, I was reading through um, their work and what people were thinking about how their brains were working. Um, I'm really interested in, in how, how the conceptual things that happen with scientists, how they decide, oh, this is a rock and there's a thing buried in this rock and that thing is the thigh bone of a dinosaur. Um, how do you make that leap if no one's ever done it before? So how, how the mind works. So, so in that sense, that was new for me this time. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I started thinking of, of, as you were talking, I was thinking poetry is kind of meteor, right? In a way, mm -hmm. you know, you just send yeah. it out and it, it lands Ooh. somewhere in time and space far from where it started. And somebody picks it up and finds the thigh bone of the dinosaur <laughs> in there somewhere, you know, I, yes. I love that. Um, but I, I think that, um, you know, I mean, one of the things, like like I said, you don't want to keep repeating yourself. And there are definitely like poems that I took out because they made the same move again. Or it was like, okay, yeah, I've got enough of these kind of poems. And I'm, I'm still, I think, somewhat in danger of repeating myself in some ways. But um, one thing for me was that I have been tarred and feathered with the um, moniker of a confessional poet. And I... I contest that I am a poet of ideas mm -hmm. and, and um, you know, uh, but I think um, some critics, sometimes male critics, especially tend to see women's work as they, they tend to look at the, at, or either look for the, the sexual above other things mm -hmm. and their response is kind of gendered in that way. So, so um, my work often gets discussed exclusively in terms of poems around uh, sexuality ignoring the other pieces of my work or ignoring the ideas in it. So I just want to say I'm a poet of ideas. So I decided to tackle this kind of confessional thing head on in this. And so there's yeah. a section called confessional poetry, which is a, a poem spread out over several pages that actually doesn't have a whole lot of words in it, uh -huh. as though each page is almost like a little white confessional that you can walk into and consider the few words that are there and um but what it is is, is an attempt to sort of discuss this whole notion of the confessional and to talk about it as a mode um which is something that i largely took from susan sontag's the pornographic mm -hmm. imagination she talks about pornography as a mode of literature and the way writers use some of the structures and conventions of full of porn to explore i mean they may be ideas about the erotic as in the case of say the marquis de sade um mm -hmm. who clearly had those predilections as well as writing about them but um but so i'm just fascinated by that idea and the way that the self can be a persona so um yeah. I, I i like to say that i expect to be widely misunderstood 
once more, but that's what I'm trying to be up to. And that's something where I just went, okay, screw it. I'm just going to hit it head on and say, yeah, this is, you know, make of it, make of it what you will, but I'm trying to make my argument for the, the person in the book, not being, not being me, but, but being in a space where you are performing the self. So. If you ever make t-shirts with I expect to be misunderstood once more, please let me know. <laughs> I'm I mean, so I, misunderstood. Oh, 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 man, it's just, that's wonderful. Uh, and, you know, uh, thinking again about each of you, uh, my next question has to do with musicality, which, well, Sandra touched upon it to some degree, but I often tell students to, uh, yeah, I mean, you want to work with what's on the page or the screen and and come up with something that's, you know, coherent, shall we say. But um, I also say, well, pretend you're drinking something. It doesn't have to be alcoholic, but to swish the language around in your mouth like a wine taster and to revel in what's that old movie, The Sound of Music. And one of the joys I've had reading your new work is just reading it out loud. You know, like you, you might take a piece of a Bach etude and I take out a saxophone and play it. We're playing the sound and I'm thinking, boy, that's a, uh, that to me is just, that's like another floor in the building of, you know, if, if poetry is a, a building or a, you know, a skyscraper or a condo or what have you. And my question is, to what extent is the musicality of language, uh, near the forefront of, of your your mo when when writing uh is it you know secondary tertiary but but just wondering you know to what extent do you uh, to quote julie andrews again revel in the the sound when crafting crafting work and uh kim i'll start with you again we'll just go go in, in the, the order in which we started if you don't mind yeah um Young history with, as an amateur musician, so I've been playing one instrument or another my most all my whole life. Mm -hmm. So, and I think that um, come really being involved with music before I came to poetry gave me a pretty good ear, and um, and so I always listen. Of course, I think every poet does listens to the language and tries to make it musical with the with the things we have available to us. Sure. You know, whether that's the whether that's high vowel versus low vowels or or the k -k 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 sound of a word or, you know, I think we all work with that and with line breaks and with, um, you know, and when things get um, very formal, as they sometimes do for some of us writers, you know, meter is about rhythm and rhyme is about sound mm -hmm. and sound and, you know, rhythmic sounds against silence is pretty much a definition of music as well so i think the voice is your instrument and we're using the techniques we have and um mm. and listen so yeah i think i place a really high importance on that sandra yeah i i wish we could have a, a pause for kim to play harmonica but we'll keep going we'll keep going <laughs> um i just because the last uh great answer talked a lot about consonants and assonance. I, I, I want to talk a little bit about syntax. I think I am, I actually think I take a lot from Elizabeth Bishop in terms of the mm. meticulousness about phrasing and syntax and, and how that engages lineation. And I think the, the downside of that is that there can be a kind of cool energy to that, that sometimes it's not clear that I'm as passionate about a subject as comes alive when I read the poems. I often have people tell me that to hear me perform my work is, you know, not not uh, better or worse, but different from encountering it on the page. And um, and I think that the the upside of having someone like Bishop as a as a guiding force is that it lets me pull off things like sestinas, where you yep. really the architecture of the poem does have to be so strong in order to keep that going through the acrobatic repetition of the end words. So, so I guess for me, um, I absolutely think of, of musicality and rhythm as part of my drafting process. I read aloud repeatedly, uh, but that's, that's, that, that rigor of, of how the sentence is shaped really interests me. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Catherine. Yeah. Um, 
that's really interesting, Sandra, because um, I have a really strange uh, formal training in poetry. I did study it a little in this country and the major poet who influenced me coming up was, was Elizabeth Bishop. So um, I, th I think we, we're in tune on, on that subject as well. But I got most of my formal training in poetry in Russia. I was taught by a woman who spoke no English. So I was working entirely in Russian and I would come out of those sessions and, and the work that I was doing, read, we read the entire canon of Russian poetry uh, for about two years. Oh. And I would come out of those sessions hearing English differently. Um, I know I also translate poetry from Russian and I think that's a huge, to me, it, the musicality of that and working with language at the sound level is really important. Um, there's a poem by Pasternak, it was a young poem, it's not a particularly famous poem, um, in which he's walking out in the garden and listening to music being played and he chooses his consonants, which are very, really perfect for it in Russian. There are lots of sh and sh and sh and these, these consonants um, are mimicking the bird song that he's hearing. Um, and so all of this uh, sound is, you know, it's, it's somewhere in my head. And when I write like Sandra, I also, you know, work very much aloud. I'm always thinking um, I probably the best technique I have is to memorize. Um, and when I memorize, I often find that I've got a poem. It's been maybe even published and I try to memorize it for a reading and I find the errors in sound only when I memorize it. Of course, that's not a useful technique when you're, when you're composing, but afterwards I'm like, boy, I wish I had you know, done that slightly differently. Um, so I think, I mean, it's always a work in progress, right? But, but sure. yeah, the, the sound is, is just, I mean, it's almost first for me. Um, I, I hear a phrase or I hear something and that's what I start with. Mm, okay, wow. Um, I'm gonna ask each of you to, to close this with a poem, but, before we do that, I want to ask what I guess is the $64,000 question, given that it's been around this time last year, the world was starting to to backtrack and, and you know, go into quarantine during this, was it they say on the news, this unprecedented time. And, and uh, I'm wondering about the impact, if any, on your respective approaches, you know, to creativity and writing, knowing that. Uh, as a teacher once said to me, writing's kind of the end result of a lot of things. And, you know, suddenly we found ourselves contending with a lot of things, to be redundant, and a lot of uh, Charles Ives, to quote that composition by Charles Ives, you know, the unanswered question. So with, you know, with that in mind, if each of you could just um, you know, talk a bit about that and, and um, how it's how you've held hands with it, walked away from it, however you want to put it. I, um, you know, some days I would just say, don't come in this house, you know, but of course it's there. And what do you do as someone trying to, among other things, uh, as Duke Ellington would say, create something worthy of the plateau. So um, Catherine, if you don't mind, we'll just go back in this order and, and then we'll, we'll close with a phone from each of you. So I'm not, really working on poetry so much. I've been doing a bunch of other things. I had three books come out in the last six months. So I've been kind of running around trying to, to um, find outlets for those. Um, mm -hmm. But I would say that for me personally, it's not so much the last year as the last four or five years since the 2016 uh -huh. election. Um, um, and that was a, I, it's not that I was not writing political poetry before then. In fact, I was, and as, as Sandra talked about earlier, there's this tradition in Ireland of poets being bards and speaking for people. There's the same tradition in Russia. And so that's part of my understanding of what a poet does. It's sort of being in the public squ square as part of what you do. And certainly after this 2016 election uh, in this country, so many things, um, needed to be said, they seem like pretty basic things about how human beings should treat one another or what we should respect or whatever it is. And it seemed like they needed saying again. So yeah. in that sense, I, you know, I've been maybe a little more vocal in an overtly political way. And that also coincided with the time that I was laureate for my community. And uh, for example, after the events in Charlottesville, we put on a, um, a, a, an event on the um, courthouse steps uh, the next day when a number of people came and there was poetry as part of that event. 
Um, mm. So, so uh, we, one of the first things we did was even before the inauguration of Donald Trump, there was a, we did a, um, a resistance poetry reading here in Arlington where a lot of poets came from around the area. So, uh, you know, in that sense, being, being able to use that platform and being able to speak out um, was, was really important. Um, so, I, so I think the, the pandemic hasn't made it really into what I've been doing. I hope maybe it will because I'm, I'm really interested in plague and pandemic and what that does um, how people react. Oh. Oh. Sandra. Yeah, I mean, you know, we were talking about Bishop earlier. I also think of, um, I think of Gwendolyn Brooks. I think of these incredible poets who've had long lives where they went through many phases of their work. And, and there are times of great turbulence that existed within the lifetime of their work. I yep. mean, I hate to say it, like, so, so what would I, I could tell you that I'm using poetry to process grief and loss and frustration and anger and sex and, you know, all these, wasn't I always doing that? I mean, I think in a weird way, the last year or the last five years, because I, I, especially living where I do six blocks away from the Capitol, um, you know, the, the last five years has changed me profoundly, but I'm, I'm almost more interested in how that's recentered me as a person. I'll, I'll be interested to see if some of the, the actual literal events, I mean, you might see more plants in my work. I've had to develop a whole different level of relationship with my balcony plants <laughs> based on the last year. And I don't mean to say that to trivialize all everything no, that's I'm gone sure. yeah. wrong, yeah. but you know, <laughs> but isn't that kind of the minutiae, right? That's yeah. also what yeah. shows up in our poetry. Yeah. Yeah, I'm still waiting to find out. <laughs> right, yeah. Oh, well, see, it's the unanswered question. And, you know, Patty Smith talked about the sea of possibility, and, and we will find out. You know, we, it's it's always kind of running around your insides, I think, somewhere. But, uh, Kim? Yeah, I think the question is just perennially unanswered. And I, I feel like, Catherine, it's more for me about the past four years. Um, just about this entire book was written between 2016 and 2020 and and part way into 2020 so i think that i think that kind of spurred just some of the the need to do it you know to to write to write more and write within and against and around and through everything mm. that has been been going on because it really it really has felt like a sort of tipping point for the for the country and even though a lot of these things as we know have been with us a long time a lot of the systemic right. um, stuff that has been happening and this kind of it, it seems to have have just laid it bare for more people the people suffering under it have always known it <laughs> and it seemed <laughs> suddenly like they started suddenly some other people started to get woke so um you know which is great to to see it happening you know um but and i so i think that just has to put some kind of new new pressure on you and it's not always direct right you're not necessarily writing pandemic poems but but mm -hmm. it's it's part of what is impressing itself on your consciousness and your psyche and and sure. we are we are people that process a lot of our experience and our our thinking and questions through language and right. through poems and so that's that's bound to come out not always in a one-to-one -one, but it's definitely bound to come out right yeah um i just want to i'll say this again but i i am so uh energized and appreciative of your respective approaches to the genre and and it is i always look for i know we we deal with the changing same within our maybe our thematic interests, but I think your commitments to originality and, um, and soul, you know, a, a musician once said jazz was soul and science. And I think you all have done a wonderful job. Well, not just with this book, this most recent book, but throughout of, of merging soul and science. And, and it's, um, I'm biased, but I'm, I'm thankful for you all and, and your work and, and thankful for this, next chorus of, of uh, you know your journeys as as i mentioned before i'd like if each of you could could close with a poem from uh, another poem from your your recent works and, um, that would be as, as my niece likes to say that would be beautiful <laughs> i'll volunteer i'll i'll okay, do it because yeah because i 
I thought, I think I'm going to read one of these monument poems. I'm going to read Jefferson Midnight. Uh, you know, since I've already alluded to growing up in the area, first right. going to Thomas Jefferson High School, then the University of Virginia. Jefferson wow. Shadow was designed to loom pretty large. And, uh, <laughs> and it's been really interesting to kind of get some historical perspective. I remember watching Hamilton for the first time, and there's that terrible just one throwaway line about Sally of uh, being of course Sally Hemings mm -hmm. and I was at the University of Virginia right when the Sally Hemings quote-unquote controversy which was really just a uh, revelation uh, uh, based on DNA yep. was was at its height um, so I think this is a good poem for me to read because it captures on one hand the wrestling of DC as a capital city uh, these founding fathers who we are now realizing if we didn't know before are so radically flawed but it's also a very neighborhoody poem, a local poem. So this captures a, a version of what might happen if you were to stumble up to Jefferson Memorial <laughs> at 2 a.m. On, on a Tuesday night, Friday night. Jefferson Midnight. In another version of this story, he's a naturalist who dabbled in politics. He reinvented the plow he joined the American Philosophical Society's Bone Committee, and while trying to prove the great Western lion, gave us our first giant sloth. He shipped a rotting moose to France to demonstrate the greatness of our mammals. He is a father of paleontology who didn't believe extinction was part of God's plan. He asked Lewis and Clark, should they encounter the mammoth to capture one. For months, his sea wall has been sinking, the Potomac's mud flats sucking at support timbers. In 1918, and for six summers after, the tidal basin was chlorinated so this bank could become a beach. Whites only. Fighters who are drawn to rising heat populate the ceiling of Jefferson's memorial. Once the sun sets, the temperature drops, they lose their grip and fall. Bodies bounce off my shoulders, bodies land in my hair. Guards call this the spider rain. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so I'll read the, I was gonna do something more political, but then I thought, I decided to do this one, which is, um, it's actually a monorhyme sonnet, so all of the n-words rhyme. Um, it's called High Desert, New Mexico. Temple of the Rattlesnake's Religion, Deluge and Heat Surge, Crash of the Atom's Rupture. Night blackens like a violin, and bright flower falls from the kitchens of heaven. This is where the seams begin to loosen, where you can walk for miles in any direction. Rabbit, lizard, raven, insect drone, and almost forget the shame of being human. Smoke tree, sage, not everything is broken. Horses appear at this remote cabin to stand outside and wait for you to come with a single apple. Abandon your despair, you who enter here forsaken. The wind is saying something. Listen. Thank you. Thank you. Catherine. Yes, I am going to read Bar at the Folle Berger, which is a very famous painting by Manet. Um, and in it, there are oranges. Um, Art historians think that uh, um, Manet used oranges in his paintings to suggest a certain kind of availability, um, that the, uh, to suggest prostitution among the women. Um, we don't know about this painting, but we do know that the, the girl who is at the bar in this painting uh, was the actual bar girl. She walked across the street from the bar, uh, from the Folie Berger and posed in Manet's studio. So bar at the Folie Berger. It starts with the scent of lavender as she buttons clean pantaloons, laces up stays, smooths her bodice and shakes out the frills, ties the black ribbon about her neck. Her costume smells as they all do, mingled sweat and makeup, 
the fabric itself splashed perhaps with the licorice twist of absinthe. Then come powder and rouge, the small earrings, a pink and white corsage already starting to droop. Her props are placed on view, beer bottles, champagne, a vase containing two pale roses, cut glass bowl of oranges that may or may not indicate a certain kind of availability. Leaning against the marble bar, she doesn't look at you. Why should she look at you? Can you give her what she needs or even cab fare home? Posing perhaps, or perhaps beyond posing, her face bleak, artificially rosy amid the moon pale globes and crystals shimmering in the ersatz heaven of the cabaret. Perhaps a man inspects her in the glass. Perhaps he's looking past. Neither of them seems to see the woman on the trapeze, feet squeezed into ankle boots of lizard green. Later, she observes his red gold lashes, watches his still young face slacken in sleep, breathes in his scent of cigars, cheap brandy, scent that clings to her fingers like orange oil as she works her nails beneath the skin methodically stripping the pith to find whatever's left of the fruit's sweet flesh. Wonderful, wonderful. Once again, many, many thanks to the three of you. Kim Adonizio, Sandra Beasley, and of course, Catherine Young for uh, your wonderful writing and I think a really informative and, and scintillating conversation. And we could go on and on, I think. It's, or as the rappers used to say, we could go on and on to the break of dawn. But readers can do that by getting your works. I'm Ruben Jackson, and your nerdy but sincere host. Thank you all again for, uh, for spending time with the readers. And with it's been a joy and a, a real honor to spend some time with you all. Thanks, Ruben. Thank thanks, you. Ruben. Thank you so much. Yay. Well, thank you, uh, Ruben, Sandra, Kim, Catherine. Uh, thank you all again for such a wonderful panel discussion. Thank you for going deep when you needed to and being uncomfortable and getting through this discussion. I really appreciate you being here with us today. Um, we have an amazing lineup of programs for both adults and children throughout the month of May. You don't wanna miss it. Um, so please go to gaithersburgbookfestival.org and look over the schedule so you can plan your festival for the month. And before you go, we have a special message for you from the amazing author and bookstore owner, Ann Patchett. Enjoy everyone, thank you again. I'm Ann Patchett here at Parnassus Books with my dog Sparky, and I wanna tell you the importance of supporting your local independent bookstore, Politics and Prose. They are a remarkable partner with this book festival. Now, when a book festival is live, it's really easy. You just go to the table and you buy your book and then you go to the event. But when a book festival is virtual, it gets a little trickier because you're home and you might think, well, you know, I'll just buy the book on Amazon. So I'm here to tell you, don't buy the book on Amazon. For one thing, Jeff Bezos has enough money, right? He's trying to colonize the moon or something. He doesn't need anything that you've got. Politics and Prose, on the other hand, they're your local independent bookstore and you love them and they bring you so many events. They work harder than any bookstore I know in their community. And if you want them to be there alive and healthy and well when all this is over, you actually need to support them. They are the people that are putting a tax base in your community, okay? So you have teachers and police officers and firefighters and when you pay a couple dollars more for a book, you're creating jobs in your community. So enjoy your book festival, support politics and prose. Remember, Ann Patchett and Sparky think it's the thing to do. Shop local, thank you.